So once again, good morning. This is Tuesday. It's April 19th, I believe. <gasps> wow, the month is more than half over already. No. Spring is here. The cherry blossoms have gone by here in Seoul, but now we have lilacs and we have azaleas. We have other flowers on the way. Mm -hmm. Spring is not over yet, hallelujah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we have this beautiful weather. We don't have to wear big, heavy sweaters and coats all the time when we go outside. And the best of all is we don't have to wear them in the classroom either. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to have the heater on. Oh, it's so nice. And today we're going to be talking about Old Testament poetry again. And we're going to continue from where we left off. We're going to do a little bit of review over figurative, figurative language and then go into the details of figurative language. And if we have time at, at the end of class, we'll talk about uh, the book of Psalms, the book of Psalms, which is just poetry, poetry, poetry from beginning to end, all 150 chapters, all right? If we don't have time for that today, then we'll talk about Psalms on Monday, okay? Very good, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this marvelous, this marvelous, word of God, this marvelous book that always amazes us and astonishes us. The more that we study it, the more that we look at it. There is so much more to it than we imagine. And we can read the same words again and again and again and find new meaning, new, new application for our lives because it's very fresh. It is a living word. It is a living word. And it finds its way into our hearts in new ways every time, because we're in new situations and you're giving us new life and your Holy Spirit makes all things new. And so Lord, we want to uh, approach the word of God this morning with meekness, with humility, <laughs> we respect it so much. And we really want to uh, learn how to appreciate it and the way that you crafted, you crafted your word. You know, it's, it's not a boring, it's not a boring book of only just narratives, but we've got poetry, we've got prophecy, we've got narrative, we've got so many things, we've got history, we've got, we've got acrostics, and all kinds of things that can keep us uh, focused on what it is that you want to share with us. So, Lord, bless our time today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So here we are at the intermission slide. But let's just go back a little bit. Okay, figurative imagery. The main point, the main idea I want to point out here is that this last paragraph it says if we want to understand the authors of the old testament it is critical that we recognize the figures of speech when they are used and that we interpret them as figures of speech and not as literal realities we have to recognize that oh they're speaking figuratively not literally we gave the example yesterday about the Bible verse that says, you know, he will cover you with the feathers of his wings. Does that literally mean God is like a bird who has wings with feathers? No, this is figurative language. But it does show us a literal reality. This next one, the authors are conveying real thoughts, events, and emotions to us. It is literal truth, but they express this truth figuratively with poetic figurative language. Let's see. Okay. And then we mentioned yesterday that there are two major categories of figurative language. There is analogy where you say something is like something else. And then there is substitution. And we'll go into both of these today. And then there's a few figures of speech that don't fall into either of those two categories. We call those the miscellaneous figures of speech. Um, figures of speech involving analogy, where you're trying to compare two items and find similarities, like mom and dad are as mad as hornets. 
they're as mad as hornets. If you can picture that in your mind, if you've ever encountered hornets or bees or wasps when they're angry and you've been stung or chased by them, have you ever been chased by angry bees or wasps? I have. I have. Oh, it's not fun. It's scary because you can hear them. They're coming right after you. It's like you try to get inside the house as fast as you can. You shouldn't, shouldn't make bees and wasps with stingers angry at you. And imagine if your parents were that angry. Yikes. Okay, and this is the last slide that we looked at yesterday. We said we were going to talk about simile, metaphor, indirect analogy, hyperbole, and then everyone's favorite category with the long words, personification, anthropomorphism, and zoomorphism. <clears throat> Let's begin. So simile. Simile is the easiest one to pick out because a simile makes a comparison using the word like or the word as to explicitly state that one thing resembles another. So you see the word like in English or you see the word as in English and you can say, wow, this must be a simile, a simile. <laughs> For example, Proverbs 11, verse 22, like a gold ring in a pig's snout, in a pig's nose, is a beautiful woman who shows no discretion. Okay, a beautiful woman who shows no discretion. Like she's not, she has no discernment about relationships. Maybe she's a little bit um, promiscuous in her relationships. Uh, she is, it's like, uh, she may look beautiful, but really not so beautiful. Not so beautiful. So that's what this woman is. She is like having a gold ring, something that looks beautiful, but it's in the nose of a pig. Noses of pigs are not considered to be the most beautiful. Okay, here's another example. Isaiah chapter one, verse 18. We know this one. Though your skin sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Okay, you have both words there. You have like, sins are like scarlet. Okay, they're red bloody right they shall be as white as snow pure pure and clean psalm 42 1 we sing this song as the deer pants for yeah. so as the deer pants for the streams of water so my soul point pants for you my god so we're saying it's a direct a direct comparison we're saying just like a deer is thirsting for water. Our souls are thirsting for God's presence. As in like similes. Okay. <clears throat> We're pretty good with similes, right? Do we need any more examples? I don't think so. Let's go on. Metaphor. A metaphor is, is like a simile. Okay, I just made a simile there but doesn't use the words like or as. So they make the analogy by direct statements without the words like or as. So Psalm 23, one, the Lord is my shepherd. Not like, not the Lord is like my shepherd or the Lord is like a shepherd. Okay, it's the Lord is my shepherd. Psalm 68, verse five. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. It's not that he is like this. He's coming out and directly saying he is this. He is this. He is. We could, we, in, our, in our brain, we can insert the word like. He is like a father to the fatherless. Proverbs 17.22. A cheerful heart is good medicine. Not a cheerful heart is as good as medicine, or a cheerful heart is like good medicine. It's just saying directly, it is good medicine. Okay, but you can notice figurative language. You know, you can picture, you can have a picture in your mind of a shepherd. 
You can think of a father, a father to fatherless children, someone who cares about orphans. You can think of good medicine. Is there such thing as good medicine? Good medicine? Does anyone like to take medicine? <laughs> Usually medicine does not taste good, but this must be... Okay, vitamin C. Okay, vitamin C. A good chewable vitamin C tablet. Okay. Now, we've done similarly in metaphor before, but we've not done indirect analogy. At least I don't remember doing indirect analogy. So let's take some time with this. Indirect analogy is a literary device. It's a figure of speech that uses the analogous item without directly stating the comparison. So it's not going to use like or as. It's not going to even use the word is. <clears throat> like we said, the Lord is my shepherd. Okay, we said a cheerful heart is good medicine. A father to the fathers a defender of, of widows is God in his holy dwelling. So when we're talking about indirect analogy, we're not even directly stating this is this, like we do with metaphor. Mm -hmm. Metaphor will come right out and say, this is this. It's very direct. Similes are very similar. This is like this. This is as this. Indirect, not going to do that. Because an indirect analogy assumes that we, as the readers, can make the comparison. We can make the connection in our brains without it having to be stated explicitly. It, they, we, the, the author says they can figure it out. I don't have to say it's like this. I don't have to say this is this. You can just, you'll just know it because it's, it's like a picture. Figurative language creates pictures in your mind or it creates an emotional response. So, for example, the writers wish to make an analogy between the Lord's wrath and a storm. Now, a simile would say the wrath of the Lord is like a storm. It's very direct. It's pointing you. The wrath is just like a storm. Okay, and a metaphor would just say, the wrath of the Lord is a storm. Okay, leaving out that like. Indirect analogy skips the identification of the analogy. It's not going to use the word like or as or is. It just states, the storm of the Lord will burst out in wrath. A driving wind swirling down on the heads of the wicked. That's what it says there in Jeremiah 30, verse 23. So there is an analogy here. The wrath of God is like the storm. It is the storm. But here, we're not using like. We're not even saying it is. We're just saying the storm of the Lord. The storm of the Lord will burst out in wrath. So we're making the connection there. We're making the connection without having to be, without the words having to point at it like, see, 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 this is what it is. This is what it's like. It doesn't say that. You have to, there's a little bit more deeper thought process involved here. So you make the connection, storm of the Lord, wrath. And then there's more descriptions, a driving wind swirling down the heads of the wicked. That's an indirect indirect analogy so here's some more examples psalm 22 verse 13 roaring lions that tear their prey open their mouths wide against me david's writing this roaring lions that tear their prey open their mouths wide against me is he talking about lions from Africa attacking him? Is the Lion King Simba coming and trying to chew him up? No. No, he's an enemy. Yeah. And he's, he's, he's assuming that you can figure this out without him saying, my enemies, like roaring lions that tear their prey, 
He doesn't say that. He just comes right out and calls them roaring lions. Because he knows you, you know that it's not literal lions. You can figure it out. Okay, Psalm 18, verse 16. He drew me out of deep waters. Was David drowning in a river? Was David drowning in the Sea of Galilee? Was he drowning in the Mediterranean Sea? No, no. But he is creating this picture an indirect analogy. He's trying to talk about what? What are the deep waters? Danger, dangerous. Because dangerous situation. His almost, problem. Almost troubles. causing, causing to death. Yeah, things that were things that were felt like they were. He was drowning in them. Drowning in problems. <laughs> drowning in troubles. Drowning from attacks from enemies. Maybe drowning in negative thinking. Okay. And he doesn't come out and say, you know, it is like this or it is this. He just calls it deep waters. And that God drew him out. God rescued him from these things. Mm -hmm. Psalm 91, verse 4. His faithfulness will be your shield and ramparts. What's the connection here? What are the what is what is what is the analogy? What are the two things being compared here? Protection. Okay. Your shield and rampart, fortress. Okay, so this here is being connected to what? Faithfulness. Faithfulness. So faithfulness, it doesn't say your faithfulness will be like or your faithfulness is. It says it will be. And then creates a word picture there that you can picture. And that, like Ann said, it, you get the overall idea. He's protecting you. He's protecting you. In each of these examples, notice the difference between indirect analogy and similes and metaphors. They know like or as, no direct words like it is or they are. <coughs> so in Psalm 22, 13, the psalmist does not say that his enemies are like lions. He doesn't even say that they are lions. He simply says that lions tearing their prey open their mouths against him. So he is drawing an analogy between his enemies and lions by implication. He is implying. He is implying. He's not coming out and saying it directly. It's like under, underneath the words, you can figure it out what he's talking about. The meaning is much the same as if he had used a metaphor or a simile, but notice the straightforward use of indirect analogy intensifies the image. He is making his enemies into lions. He's not saying they're like lions. He's saying they're lions, roaring lions. That's much more intense, powerful language. He skips right to the image that he wants his readers to have in their heads. And he describes that image. All right. So, indirect analogy. Indirect analogy. Is it clear in your head? Yes? All right. Because again, go ahead, Anne. Uh, the indirect image, image, imagery is the straightforward use of, oh, no, no, uh, intensifies the image, I agree, yeah, from the order of a similar metaphor and indirect uh, analogy. I think indirect analogy really intensified the image. Right. And so Think about it. If, if you really want to insult somebody, you could say, oh, you are like a pig. You are a pig. Or you can say, you pig. Oh, that hurts even more. It's not just saying that you are like a pig or you are a pig. It's like, you pig. It's like I'm calling you by a name like you actually are a pig. It's much more intense. Mm -hmm. Is much more intense. Okay, so it could go the other way. Um, let's say, think of like something that 
a man might say to a woman that he's dating who wants to tell him that she, you know he likes her or she's beautiful or she's cute or something he can say oh you are like you are like a little puppy or or he could say you are a puppy or if he goes hey puppy why don't you come over here and see me you know he's actually calling her puppy instead of saying you were like this or you're similar to this so you are this if he calls her puppy and that's her nickname or something and that's a little bit more intense it's more even though it's indirect it becomes much more direct in a sense because it's so much more intense okay Like when Jesus is rebuking the Pharisees, he doesn't say you are like blind guides. He doesn't say you are blind guides. He says blind guides. He just comes straight out and calls them that. It's much, it's intense. It's, that's an indirect analogy. Okay, here is hyperbole. Here is hyperbole. We want to talk about this. Because the last time when we studied New Testament, there were some people who, who didn't seem to understand this kind of question when we had it on the test. So let's take just a little bit of time for this. Hyperbole, it is a conscious exaggeration for the sake of, of an effect. You are doing this on purpose because you are trying to make an effect upon the reader or the hearer. So it is as an expression of strong feeling, hyperbole intentionally exaggerates and advertises his lack <coughs> of literal truth. I'm so hungry, I could eat a whale. Really? Do you think I could? <laughs> Could anybody sit down today for lunch and eat a whole whale? No, no. It's a, a, it's, I intentionally am exaggerating how hungry I am by creating like this ridiculous image, sitting down with you know a knife and a fork and like slowly eating a whale. It would take forever, okay? But, so it's, it cannot be literally true. So, but I'm exaggerating to create an effect. I'm trying to tell you, I am really, really hungry. I'm not just a little bit hungry. I am very hungry. So let's go eat, something like that. Now the poets of the Old Testament employ hyperbole frequently to express deep emotion, deep, strong emotion. Remember, hyperbole is intentional exaggeration. You're gonna make it big. You're gonna make it big because it's a strong, deep emotion. For example, Psalm 42, <coughs> my tears have been my food day and night. My tears have been my food day and night. Can you eat your tears? Can you survive very long eating tears every meal? No. And if you've been doing it day and night, like you have not stopped crying, all day and all night and you're eating your tears like when you picture that you go that can't be true that can't be true but what is he actually saying what is what is the deep emotion it's just so sad so incredibly incredibly sad sorrowful sorrowful like he hasn't even been able to eat. He's so sad. And so all he's, the tears are running down his face and maybe leaking into his mouth. Okay. The next one, Psalm 1842. I beat them. And I inserted this word enemies. I beat them as fine as wind blown dust. I trampled them like mud in the streets. So you went out to your enemies and you beat them until they turned into dust. Mm -hmm. Wow. And I trampled them like mud in the streets. Can you, could David literally do that? No. That's an exaggeration, big exaggeration. But what is he saying that he did? 
he attacked them, you know. So angry. Yeah, clearly. He's angry. He is very angry. He is very angry and he defeated them thoroughly. He defeated them thoroughly because he was very angry. And so now they're gone. <laughs> they're like dust blown away in the wind. They're gone. They're gone. Psalm 40, verse 12. For troubles without number surrounded me. Troubles without number surrounded me. Without number means what? So, so numerous. So many you can't count them. Mm. Is there really that many? Well, according, yeah. this is probably David again. According to David, yes. I have so many problems. I can't even name them all. I can't even count them all. Mm. And they surround me. You know, like enemies. I can't get away from them. It's an exaggeration. But I mean, we've all felt this way. <clears throat> we've all felt this way. You get so upset about something. You know, somebody breaks up with their boyfriend and their girlfriend. They're crying. Like, I just want to die. You know? Do they really want to die? No, they don't. They don't. <laughs> But they feel so bad, like they exaggerate, they exaggerate so that you can, you don't know how I feel, I want you to understand. And so they say something very exaggerated. Yeah. I felt about this big, you know, were you really that big? No. To interpret the passage in Psalm 40, verse 12, as meaning that David's troubles are in reality too numerous to count, is to misunderstand David. This is not literal. David is overwhelmed by his trouble, and he really wants to stress the magnitude of his trouble, how big his troubles are. He is not suggesting that his troubles number more than one million or one billion or some other extremely high number that he can't count to. No, he's just saying these troubles seem so much, so much. <laughs> okay, so does that make hyperbole a little bit clearer? I hope so. I think uh, exaggeration is just uh, one uh, attribute of human psychology. Mm -hmm. And God uses it, right? Yeah. Because it, it, it communicates to us. It makes us think what he wants us to know. Uh, because of this uh, tendency, maybe tooth, tooth for tooth, <laughs> eye for eye. <laughs> yeah. When we face something happening against us, mm -hmm. we, we feel much stronger than what really happens. Right. Right. And remember that that we have this remember one of the things we said about poetry is that it allows people to express their deep emotions how they feel towards god how they feel about their situations remember some of these psalms are like david pouring out his heart pouring out his soul to the lord he's asking him help me save me i need you and he doesn't hold back. That's what's so shocking because, you know, a lot of us, we are very much more reserved. We hold in our emotions. We don't let people know what we're thinking and what we're feeling. We think it's too much to let other people know that. But as far as David is concerned, yes, maybe I don't do that with people, but with God, I can tell God everything. I can tell God exactly what I'm thinking. I can tell God exactly how I feel. I have nothing to be ashamed of when I talk to God. I can pour it all out. Now I could come to one of you and I could say, ah, you know, just crying. And, but what can you do? What can you do? I mean, you can maybe comfort me and say, yes, yes, I understand. Calm down. It'll get better. God loves you. But, uh, but really, can you, you can't solve my problems without number. You can't handle all of my enemies, but God can. And so one of the things we're going to talk about is that 
David gives us a model about how we should handle our problems, how we should handle our troubles. But pour it out to God. Give it all to him. And don't hold back. Don't think like, well, God's going to think I'm stupid if I say this. No, he's not. David didn't think he was being stupid when he said these things. He wanted, he wanted God to know. He had a relationship with God where he could say whatever he wanted to to God and let it all out. God heard him. Okay, here we go. Here we are. The personification, anthropomorphism, and zoomorphism. Okay, these are three figures of speech that are similar in that they attribute one entity the characteristics of a totally different kind of entity. So one thing like a, a tree, a, a something that's living like a, like a plant or an animal or stars or things like this, they're not living. Some, some, something that God has created, but give it the characteristics of another thing that God has created. Now, also it can be used for describing God. And God is uncreated, so I should qualify that. So personification, we'll start with personification, involves attributing human features and human characteristics to non-human entities. Okay, so something that's not human, we're, we're talking about it as though it is human in a way. For example, Psalm 24, 7, lift up your heads, you gates. Does a gate have a head? No, no, but you're, you're personifying it. You're giving it a human quality. It has a head. Isaiah 44, 23, burst into song, you mountains, you forests, and all you trees. Human beings can sing. We can burst into song. Like if Hannah is filled with the Holy Spirit, she could suddenly start singing all of a sudden. Or screaming. <laughs> Making loud noises. But can a mountain sing? Can a tree sing? Can a whole forest be a choir singing? Not literally. I've never been to the mountain and heard the mountain with a big deep voice singing a song. Or I've gone into the forest and heard all the a choir of trees but so this is giving is giving these non-human and actually like a mountain it's rock it's not really alive this personification they, they can have a mouth and vocal cords and sing songs isaiah 1 2 hear me you heavens listen earth like listen stars listen moon listen sun and planets open your ears listen Listen, earth, as though they have ears and they have intelligence. Proverbs 120, out in the open, out in the open, wisdom calls aloud. She raises her voice in the public square. So wisdom, wisdom is not even something that's tangible. It's not like a tree or a mountain that you can go and touch and walk on. It's not like stars you can see in the sky. <laughs> wisdom is something that's intangible. It's like, an, it's like a, a concept, it's an idea, it's a thing. But now we're saying it's like a woman, she. We're actually making it female. And she calls, she has a mouth, she has a voice. And she goes places, she goes to the public square. <laughs> Very personified. Okay, so personification, when you give human characteristics to non-human things, okay? Uh, some people name their cars. Some people give their car a name. Some people give their cars female names. Some of them give their cars male names. And sometimes I've heard people talk to their cars. <laughs> You know, they're riding in the car, and the car's having a hard time getting up the hill. And let's say they name their car Betty. Betty, come on, Betty, 
come on, baby. Come on, girl, we can get up to the top. You know, they're talking to the car and they're, they're actually calling it a girl. Come on, girl, we can get to the top of the mountain. We can get over and then they get over the top. Like, oh, good job, baby, good job. Oh. Yes, I'm gonna put extra special gas in your tank next time. I'm gonna change your oil with the best oil. You know, they, they treat their, their car like it's human in a sense. Yeah. You know, and all ships, all ships are considered women. All ships and boats are just, that's this kind of like sailor culture. They all think of their ship as a she, as a she, as a woman. I wonder why that's true. Anyways. Okay, so there's personification. Now we get to anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism. It is the representation, representation of God with human features or human characteristics. It's almost like personification for God. It's like giving human characteristics to God. Anthropo meaning human, human being, morphism, change or form. Okay, so give it, almost like saying that God has a human form. Now we know that God did have a human form. He came to this earth. But God is a spirit, right? God is described as having hands in the Bible, arms, feet, a nose, breath, a voice, and ears. That's all in scripture. In scripture, it says that God walks, he sits, he hears, he looks down, he thinks, he talks, he remembers, he gets angry, he shouts, he lives in a palace. He prepares tables. He anoints, oh, anoints heads. <laughs> I should put a comma in there. He builds houses and he pitches tents. These are things that human beings do. But we're saying that God does this and God inspires men to write this about him. As though he had human features like a heads and arms and hands and feet and voice and everything. So also, God has these things. He has a rod. He has a staff. He has a scepter. He has a banner. He has garments. He has a tent. He has a throne. He has a footstool. He has a vineyard. He has a field. He has a chariot. He has a shield. He has a sword. Like He has possessions that he uses. God is also called a father, a husband, a king. And a shepherd. All these human actions or human features are used figuratively, not literally, to describe God and his actions. When you see the whole list there, you go like, wow, there's a lot. There's a lot that we say about God that is anthropomorphic. For example... Psalm 27, 8, your face, Lord, will I seek. I will seek your face. Well, how does a spirit have a face? Anthropomorphism. We say he has a face. Psalm 53, 2, God looks down from heaven on all mankind. Okay? 29, 4, the voice of the Lord is powerful. 19, 4, in the heavens, God has pitched his tent for the sun. He's like gone out camping, made a tent to put the sun inside of it. Interesting picture there. So do all representations of God in human terms involve figures of speech? So when it says that God has a voice, Okay, did you see that? The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is powerful. Is that always figurative language or could it be literal? Yeah, I mean, could it be literal? Sometimes. I mean, three times there was a voice from heaven, right? During Jesus' yes, ministry. Jesus. This is my son, my beloved son. 
Yeah, here, and also, this is my son, hear ye him. Three times there is a voice that comes down from heaven. <clears throat> so, does God, could God have a voice? Yes. So, in some cases, it is literal, but other cases, it is poetic, it is figurative language. So, this, it says, this is an interpretive issue that takes us into broader areas of theology. And we have this question, well, what is God really like? Since we were created in the image of God, how similar are we to God? You know, if we are made in God's image, you know, what, what about us? You know, how similar are we to him? Is, are there any physical characteristics that we have that are similar to God? Clearly, if God is a spirit, then the description of God looking down or the mentions of his hands would be figures of speech. Because a spirit, a spirit does not have physical form. It does not have eyes. It does not have hands. That would be considered anthropomorphism. However, when we talk about God's anger and his love and his patience and his mercy and his hurt and his compassion, could that be could that be literal? These are probably literal realities, and we're not talking about figures of speech. Okay. We understand these emotions in human terms because we experience these same emotions. But that does not necessarily qualify them as figures of speech. On the other hand, does God have ears? Probably not, except for Jesus Christ, the son, because he now has a human form, but like God, the father. No, we suspect that all of the physical human references to God are figurative. But we don't know for certain because we haven't seen him. We haven't gone to heaven and seen him face to face. That's what we safely assume. Okay, now let me just ask this question. Why, why does God use anthropomorphism in the Bible? Why does he include that in scripture? Uh, for our understanding, we can understand it better and more clearly. Yes, right. It's to help us to understand who God is better, to know him better. I mean, God is personal, God is relational, we know this, because of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> he came here and he lived among people and he ate meals with them and he talked with them. He had a sense of humor. He got angry. He got hungry. You know, we can see that God is personal. He is very mm -hmm. relational. And this, by making God human-like, you know, with a voice and with ears and with eyes, you know, then we can re we can relate to that. It's harder for us to relate to a spirit, something that we cannot see, something that we can't even really imagine or picture in our minds. So God allows the Holy Spirit to say, yeah, okay, let's use some anthropomorphic language here mm -hmm. because human beings can understand and relate to God better in that sense. Okay, so... If we can picture God as something, somebody similar to us, it's easier, it's easier to comprehend him, but in our limited way. Then we get to zoomorphism. Zoomorphism is when you use animal imagery to describe God. Okay. However, other inanimate objects are also used as figures of speech to describe God. For example, Psalm 91 4, he will cover you with his feathers. We've been using this one. And under his wings, you will find refuge. Okay? Feathers and wings. We're talking about birds. But we're saying God, God is doing this. God has feathers. God has wings. Is that literal or figurative? Of course, it's figurative, right? The Lord is my rock. Okay, so this is not an animal imagery, but it's like something that we can picture. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock, 
in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Look, we got one, two, three. There's the rock again. Three, uh, four, five, six. At least six different things. Six different things that we're saying, this is God. This is God. And people in David's day, they all, everyone knows what a rock is. We still know what rocks are, right? Okay. But like the horn of my salvation, what is that horn of my salvation? That's something maybe we would have to like do word study and study about context and historical context. What's a horn, horn of salvation? But it's something that's literal in David's day. He's saying God is like this. Certainly the passage from Psalm 91 verse four does not imply that God is a bird or that he resembles a bird in any physical aspect. He doesn't have a beak. He doesn't have little claws on the ends of his toes and so on. But there is an analogy between God and a mother hen, for instance, that surrounds her chicks with her wings to protect and comfort them. That's what he's trying to communicate there. Like he's, he, could, he could have written, God protects and comforts people. Okay. But if you put it another way, you know, he will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. And you have this picture in your mind of the mother hen with her little baby chickens. You know, that's much more vivid, stronger picture. You imagine like the warmth and the softness of the feathers and the wings and hiding there. You being the little chicken hiding underneath the wings. Safe. That's a beautiful picture. Helps us to really understand God's heart. God comforts and protects, protects and comforts his people in the same way. Now we have to keep in mind that an anthropomorphism or a zoomorphism can also be a simile, a metaphor, or indirect analogy. For example, we already did this one, Psalm 23, 1. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. There's a metaphor but it's also an anthropomorphism. Okay, we're saying he is like a human shepherd. Likewise, Isaiah 44, 23, burst into song, you mountains, is a personification. We're giving them human characteristics, but it's also hyperbole. It's a big exaggeration. Like a mountain all of a sudden, oh, you know, <laughs> singing praises to God, like the hallelujah chorus. So they can be more than one thing at the same time. Okay. So those are the ones where we're talking about, we said that there's two major kinds of figures of speech. Ones that involve analogy and ones that involve substitution. So these were all the analogy ones. Okay, simile. If we're looking at a simile, what, what keywords will we see in a simile? Like and as like it or as yes in a metaphor we don't, we we don't like or as without like or as but usually with a verb like is or are like a being verb the lord is my shepherd we are the sheep of his pasture okay okay are we actually sheep no figure of speech um, then we also had the indirect analogy, indirect analogy. So we're not seeing like and as, we're not seeing is or are. We're just coming out and stating that something, calling it as though it is. Okay. If I said to Hannah, you rat. Yeah, what do I mean? And it doesn't want to say. <laughs> you rat. Yeah, is it a nice thing to say about somebody? No. Oh, oh. If you say somebody is a rat, it usually means like somebody that's not 
trustworthy, a liar, a betrayer, somebody who, you know, has done something bad to you. You rat. Okay, I don't say, Hannah, you're like a rat. Hannah is a rat. But if I just come right out and say, you rat, that's, that's indirect analogy. I'm just coming right out and calling her as though she is that thing. Okay? So I'm implying something there. And then we had hyperbole. Hyperbole. What's the key word with hyperbole? Peak. Not, Big peak. Intended, intended exaggeration, right? What were you saying, Wendy? Make a peak. Yeah, make it big. <laughs> make it big. A big exaggeration intentionally. Why? In the Bible, why do they, why does the Holy Spirit direct people to use? For, for effect, for the sake of effect. Uh, the effect, to show that there's something very strong, something very deep there, deep emotion, deep thought. Okay, and then we had our three kinds of personification, anthropomorphism, and zoomorphism. Okay, and remember the last two, zoomorphism and anthropomorphism apply to God. It's the ways that we try to make an invisible God visible in our minds, at least. We can picture God as being a shepherd. We can picture God as being a shield. Okay? So those are for, for God only. Anthropomorphism and zoomorphism are for God. Personification is for other things, where we're trying to give them human characteristics. All right, now we're gonna look at figurative images that involve substitution. Substitution, All right? Now, when I first learned this, I learned it as metonymy, metonymy. M-E-T-O-N-Y-M-Y, -E metonymy. Mm -hmm. But the author that I was reading says, you can also think of this as being effects and causes. Effects and causes. So this is a good explanation that the author of the book that I was reading gave. He says, imagine you are at a baseball stadium watching a baseball game. That's fun. The home team is behind by three runs. It is the bottom of the ninth inning. Like this is their last chance to score runs. If they don't score at least three runs, the game is over and they're going to lose. So the bases are loaded. Oh my gosh, there's a runner on first, second, and third base. Oh, but there's two outs, two outs. If you make it out, the game is over. And the best hitter on the team it's his turn to come up to bat. If he hits a home run, wow, the game will end with a victory for the home team. If he hits a home run, all three of those people on first, second, and third will score, plus the hitter will score. Four runs, woo, we win the whole game. Okay. An excited fan in front of you jumps up to his feet and pleads loudly with the hitter saying, make me happy. Make me happy! Make me happy! Okay, he's not saying hit a home run. Um, he's saying make me happy. This happens. I don't know if you ever have this in Korea, but you have crazy fans in America that say stuff <laughs> like this. Okay. Now the fan is unconsciously using a figure of speech, a substitutionary figure of speech that involves cause and effect. What he wants is for the batter to hit a home run. But what he says is, make me happy. Now, if the batter hits a home run, the fan will be happy because his team will have won. Okay. He could simply say, hit a home run. But in an attempt to express himself Colorfully, poetically, very expressively, 
he substitutes the effect, which is happiness, his happiness, for the cause of what would make him happy, hitting a home run. Okay? So instead of saying hit a, hit a home run, this would be the cause, he says, make me happy, which would be what would happen if the batter hits a home run. So he's, ex he's expressing the effect instead of shouting out the cause. And the poets of the Old Testament <clears throat> often use this same literary device. They substitute the effect in place of the cause. Okay, so you can, if you know what the effect is, you can think backward to what the cause is. You can figure it out. All right, let's take a look at this. Here's an example, David, in Psalm 51, verse 8. He says, let me hear of joy and gladness. Let me hear of joy and gladness. Now, this is the effect. This is what he wants to happen. Now, the cause, the cause that David is really asking for is forgiveness. He wants forgiveness for his sin with Bathsheba. But he doesn't come out and say the cause. He is talking, he's going to talk about the effect. What David states, you know, when he says, let me hear of joy and gladness, he is stating the result of that forgiveness. If he receives forgiveness, he will have joy and gladness. So he is in a poetic way, a colorful way, asking God, please forgive me. But instead of saying, please forgive me, he says, let me hear of joy and gladness. I want the, and he's talking about the effect instead of the cause. So David substitute the effect of the cause. Here's another example from Proverbs, Proverbs 19, 13. A foolish child is his father's ruin. Okay, so we see this phrase here, his father's ruin. That is the effect. That is being substituted for the cause. Okay, the cause is all the things that a foolish child does that lead to the ruin. Okay, so a foolish child is his father's ruin. Okay, a foolish child, instead of saying a foolish child does this and this and this and this and this and this and this, all these foolish things, he states the effect of all those dumb things that the child does. He says a foolish child is his father's ruin. The effect is taking the place of all the causes that he could have listed. Here's another one, Jeremiah 14, seven, let my eyes overflow with tears. Let my eyes overflow with tears. So the, the tears are the effect. This is what's being produced. But what he's really talking about, he's talking about the Babylonian invasion that's coming. He knows it's coming because he's prophesied it. And he actually has heard word, they're coming. They're coming to destroy Jerusalem and they're going to take it over. That is going to be the cause for all this crying. So instead of saying the Babylonians are coming and it will be awful. Okay, that's one way to say what he could say. He actually states the emotional effect of the invasion that it will have on him. Let my eyes overflow with tears. <laughs> Okay, so it's, it's subtle, it's sort of indirect, but it's very effective. It's very effective. It's very, I mean, like poetry really touches our hearts. He's really describing his feelings about what is going to happen next. Okay, so let's go back. Okay, this is metonymy, metonymy. And it's related to effects and causes. And this is one of the substitution figures of speech. The, the poet, the author, the writer substitutes the effect, the results in place of the cause. He does not come out and directly say exactly what he's hoping for or what he's hoping won't happen in the case of Jeremiah. 
but um, he comes out, he expresses the effect. So it's like the make me happy means like, please hit a home run. Okay. Uh, let me, let me uh, hear of joy and gladness instead of saying, please, God, forgive me. Forgive me for my sin. You know, let my eyes overflow with tears. Like, God, I'm so sad about this invasion that I see that it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Oh, I wish it wouldn't happen. I wish it wasn't this way, Lord. Okay, so substituting the effect for the cause. Now, I don't think, <laughs> I'm trying to think, would I ever give you a verse and say, is this metonymy? Because <laughs> it's really hard to pick these out unless you do it all the time. Okay, but it's, I, you we expect to just to know what metonymy is. Okay, it's substituting the effect in the place of the cause. Okay. And it's a figure of speech. It's a substitution figurative language. Here's another one. Um, we, I learned it a long time ago as synecdoche. Synecdoche. You like that word? Synecdoche. <laughs> Synecdoche. But actually, another more recent term, they call it representation. Representation. And like it says here, the poets will often substitute a representative part of an entity instead of the entity itself. Now, this happens all the time. We hear it on the news all the time. In English, you know, when there's something in the news, we use the capital of a country to represent the country itself. For example, we might, you might hear on the news, relations between Seoul and Beijing are difficult at this time. Okay, it might say something like that in the news. Well, Seoul means Korea, Beijing means China. Okay, Re relations between Moscow and Washington are strained at this moment, okay? Moscow meaning Russia, Washington meaning the United States. So taking us a part of something and letting it represent the whole of something. In the Old Testament, poets will often use cities or tribes to represent entire nations figuratively. So Ephraim, which is one of the tribes, and Samaria, which is a capital city, are used to refer to the northern kingdom of Israel. While Judah, another tribe, and Jerusalem, the capital city, are used to refer to the southern kingdom of Judah. Okay, so when it says, you know, Ephraim was striving with Judah, it means the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom were having bad relations with each other. Now, there are numerous other representative figures of speech. For example, Psalm 44, 6 uses the words bow and sword, bow and sword, bow and sword, to represent weapons of war in general. It says, I put no trust in my bow. My sword does not bring me victory. Okay, it's not just this particular weapon and this particular weapon. It's talking about weapons in general, weapons of war. I'm not going to depend upon military weapons. I'm going to use God. I'm going to depend upon God to fight my battles. Psalm 20, verse 7 uses the word chariots and horses to represent military power. Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. So, so you can say some people trust in military power, but we trust in God's power. But they're using representative things like chariots and horses representing all of military power. Feet. Feet can be used to stand for the entire person. In Psalm 122, verse 2, it says, our feet are standing in your gates, Jerusalem. Okay, my feet did not detach from my body and go stand at the gate, and the rest of me is over here going, look, look at this, my feet over there standing in the gates. That's not possible. Wherever my feet are, my whole body is. Okay, so we're using representative substitutionary language. If I say our feet are standing in your gates, it means our whole bodies are, but it's a colorful way of saying the same thing. 
bones. Bones often stand for the whole person, especially in context of suffering and pain. Like Psalm 6-2, have mercy on me, Lord, for I am faint. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are in agony. My bones are in agony. It means my whole body, my whole body. Lips are often used as a figurative substitute for a person's speech. Everyone lies to their neighbor. They flatter with their lips, but harbor deception in their hearts. They're flattering with their words, but lips are representing the words that come out through the lips. Okay, that one's probably a little bit easier to pick out and understand. Like if you saw something and I say, is this synecdoche? Synecdoche, and you go, oh, yes, okay. You know, when, when they're saying Samaria, it means the Northern Kingdom of Israel, not just that one city, okay? If, if it says, you know, my hand, my hand is there, means my whole body is there because my hand is not separate from my body and so on. Now there are miscellaneous figures of speech. Um, we have figures of speech uh, that are artistic and it's very hard to categorize them very neatly. It says, although many figures fall into categories of analogy or substitution, a few of them fall outside of these categories. And two of these miscellaneous figures of speech that are fairly common are apostrophe and irony. Now we've done irony before, but we haven't done apostrophe before, at least in the study of hermeneutics. I remember a number of years ago when we were studying something else, we were also looking at all kinds of figures of speech. An apostrophe, I don't know if that was one of them. So I'm looking at the clock and thinking about the time. Do I really want to go into apostrophe and irony and so on, or do I want to stop here? How do you feel? Have you been sitting too long? It's okay. It's okay? You're okay? Well, let me just see how long it's going to take to go through all these. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I think we'll save this for Monday, okay? Because there's a lot more here, and then so Monday we'll go over these miscellaneous figures of speech. We'll also talk about the Book of Psalms in particular. Mm -hmm. Why are we including Psalms here in the books of Old Testament poetry and not with the wisdom books? Okay, usually when you think of the wisdom books, you say, what are the five wisdom books? You go, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, you know, Song of Solomon. Okay, but we're, we're, what we're doing, we're keeping Psalms here with the books of poetry. You'll see why. <laughs> and uh, I think that's enough for today. I think my mouth is wearing out. Are you okay, Hannah? Yes. You're okay. All right. All right. How about everybody online? How are you? I think we are so familiar with sentences uh, using metonymy, snack to key, and so on. So, but we do not have to think that, oh, this is metonymy or this. Right. Automatically, yeah. we understand the meaning. Right. We use it. We use it <laughs> often, but we don't know, like, oh, I just use synecdoche or metonymy or uh, hyperbole and so on. But we do, it's just part of our language. It's the way that we express ourselves as human beings. But it's interesting, you know, because book, God is writing this book for human beings and he's using human beings to write the book, of course, he's going to incorporate all these things in the, in the stories that he writes and especially in the poetry that he has written. So, yeah. But we, it is helpful and useful to know mm -hmm. the things. Right. It's helpful, especially when you come across a verse 
And maybe someone says, what does this mean? You know, especially when something is written in figurative language, you know, and maybe there's like a new, a new believer who is reading the Bible and they come across something that's written in figurative language. And they ask you, what does this really mean? Does it really mean what it says it means? <clears throat> and you can say, well, no, this is figurative language. This is an example of anthropomorphism, or this is an example of, if you knew the word, metonymy, or whatever. It's not really saying this about God or this about people, you know, not literally, but figuratively, it's talking this way so that we can understand it. But built on, but these figurative pictures and language, these illustrations are built upon a literal reality. And if you go below the surface of the beautiful, colorful language, then you see the truth. And that's what's really real. That's what's really true. And you can help explain to somebody, no, God does not have feathers. He doesn't have wings. Or, you know, God is not literally a shepherd. We are not literally sheep. But there's a beautiful picture there about our, how we can relate to God. And we are like sheep and he is like a shepherd. But, you know, we don't have wool. You know, we don't, you know, we don't go mad, except a few times. So it, it can be useful. It is also useful for our own Bible study when we're trying to interpret the word of God for ourselves. You know, and you might go to a, a commentary and it says, well, you know, Isaiah is using metonymy here or Jeremiah is using personification here. And you, if you know what those words mean, then you go, oh, okay, now I see it. Helps you understand better. All right, so today, sometime later today, I will send you a new quiz. The new quiz is based upon last week's classes about the Old Testament law. Yes, so you can use the slides. You can look at the slides to help you answer the questions. It's a good way to review refresh your memory so it gets in there and uh are you excited thank ah. you <laughs> hannah's doing this like ah oh, quiz you know her mom is like yes. <laughs> <laughs> there's a difference here between the generations <laughs> okay yes so on monday we will finish poetry if we have time then we'll start the next unit. And I can't remember if it's prophets or, or wisdom books. I think maybe it's prophets. But if we have time, we'll, we'll start that. We'll just, as we go along, we're just being led by God. When to start, when to stop. Okay. All right. Let's have a word of prayer here. Father God, thank you. Thank you again for the blessing and the privilege and the honor to stand in front of these saints of God and to try and explain a few things about your word so that we can have a greater appreciation of the Bible and, and be able to interpret it properly because we want to know what you have to say to us. And we want to be able to uh, communicate it to others as well. So Lord, help us, help us as we, as we read our daily devotions and read, read passages of scripture, Lord, speak to us, point out things to things that maybe we never noticed before. You know, whisper into our ears, Rama, Rama from your Holy Spirit, build us up in truth and in your grace today. And watch over each one, keep them safe and in your care, keep them under your your wings under your feathers, Lord. Watch over them, comfort and protect them in these days ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Pastor. We'll see you Monday. Thank you. You're welcome.